Around 300 BC, the Greek mathematician Euclid of Alexandria proved that there are infinitely many prime numbers. A prime number, of course, being a positive integer greater than 1 with exactly two distinct factors. So 8, for example, is not prime because it has more than two distinct factors. 1, 2, 4, and 8 are all factors of 8, so 8, not prime. On the other hand, a number like 5 has exactly two distinct factors, 1 and 5, so 5 is prime. For many reasons, the prime numbers are of central importance in mathematics, and so Euclid's proof that there are infinitely many of them is one of the most well-known proofs. Euclid himself is most well-known for his textbook, The Elements, which comprises 13 books or sections, and so is often released in two volumes. This is a copy of the first six books of the Elements of Euclid. While Euclid's proof of the infinitude of the prime numbers is perhaps the simplest and most well-known proof of the result, in the 18th century, one of the most prolific mathematicians of all time, Leonard Euler, was at work, and today I would like to show you his proof of the infinitude of the prime numbers. While Euclid's famous textbook is typically published in two volumes, the work produced by Euler is unbelievably massive. He was astonishingly prolific, and his work comprises hundreds of books and papers. Even his letters written to a German princess take up two whole bulky volumes. So it is perhaps little surprise that Euler would have a proof of one of math's most classic results. Central to the argument will be establishing an equality between this sum on the left and this product on the right. This character on the left is an uppercase Greek sigma, it is the summation sign, so what this sum is, is the sum of reciprocals of positive integers. It looks like this, 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4, etc. Note that this first term is 1 over 1, which happens to be 1. This on the right is a product, this character is the Greek uppercase pi, and this product is to be taken for all prime numbers p. So it would look like 1 divided by 1 minus 2, the first prime, to the negative 1 power, multiplied by 1 over 1 minus 3, the next prime, to the negative 1 power, and so on. Now, of course, this sum on the left has infinitely many terms, because there are infinitely many positive integers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, we can go on as far as we like. On the right, though, we don't know yet if this product consists of infinitely many terms, because, of course, the whole argument here is whether or not there are infinitely many primes. If there are, then indeed this product will have infinitely many factors, one for every one of those infinitely many primes. But if in fact there are finitely many primes, this product would only have finitely many factors. Like I said, this equality is what will be key to our proof. We need to show this equality is true. But note, the power of the prime numbers here are negative 1, and the power of n, these integers, is 1. We see 2 to the power of 1, 3 to the power of 1, 4 to the power of 1, and so on. But as we go through the argument to establish this equality, we'll actually not use 1 and negative 1. We're going to use powers of s and negative s, where s is just some real number greater than 1, because in fact this equation does hold for any s greater than 1. So we'll prove this more general case because we can, and once we're done that, we'll go back to this case that we actually need to complete the infinite prime argument. We're going to start with this sum in question, the sum of the reciprocals of the s powers of the positive integers, and then we'll massage it just right to yield our desired result. Now imagine we take both sides of this equation and multiply them by 1 over 2 to the s, the reciprocal of the s power of the first prime number, which is 2. Then on the left, of course, we just have 1 over 2 to the s times the sum, and on the right, imagining how we would distribute that 1 over 2 to the s times these infinitely many terms, we would first have 1 over 2 to the s times 1, which is 1 over 2 to the s. Then, 1 over 2 to the s times 1 over 2 to the s, so we would have plus 1 over 4 to the s. Then, 
1 over 2 to the s times 1 over 3 to the s, so 1 over 6 to the s, and so on. These denominators would all just be the s powers of multiples of 2. Now what happens if we subtract the second equation from the first equation? Well, on the left side, we have this sum, and then we'd be subtracting 1 over 2s times the sum. So in total, on the left, we would have 1 minus 1 over 2s copies of this sum, which looks like that. On the right, of course, we'll have all of these terms, but take away the even ones which have been subtracted. The even ones, of course, being the terms whose denominators have the s powers of multiples of 2. Thus, we would still have 1 on the right side, but 1 over 2 to the s would be cancelled out. We'd still have 1 over 3 to the s, but 1 over 4 to the s would be cancelled out. We'd still have 1 over 5 to the s, and so on. Just all of the odd numbers. Now, say we move on to the next prime number. So this first thing we did was take the sum and multiply by 1 over 2 to the s. Let's take this new expression we have and multiply by 1 over 3 to the s. Then, this is what we have on the left. Note how we're multiplying by 1 over 3 to the s. On the right, first, we'd have 1 over 3 to the s times 1, which gives us 1 over 3 to the s. Then, 1 over 3 to the s times 1 over 3 to the s, so 1 over 9 to the s. Notice how we skipped a multiple of 3. We skipped 1 over 6 to the s because 6 was even and already got cancelled out with that 2. The next term would be 1 over 3 to the s times 1 over 5 to the s, so 1 over 15 to the s, and so on. We're going to have all of the multiples of 3, excluding the even ones. Now again, what happens if we subtract this equation? from this one. On the left, we'll have 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s copies of this, and on the right, we're going to have all of these terms of the sum, excluding those that are multiples of 3. Again, many multiples of 3 that are even numbers have already been knocked out, but remaining multiples of 3, like 1 over 3 to the s, and 1 over 9 to the s, 1 over 15 to the s, all of those are going to be cancelled out. So this is what we have on the left after the subtraction, and on the right, we have 1 plus 1 over 5 to the s we still have, plus 1 over 7 to the s we still have, 1 over 9 to the s we've no longer got, but we do have 1 over 11 to the s, and so on. Now let's take a step back and look at what's going on here. On the left, we're taking this sum, which as we've said is important to our central argument, and we're multiplying it by the denominator of the factors in this product. The factors in the product, which is central to our argument, consist of 1 divided by 1 minus the reciprocal of primes. And the things we're multiplying by are 1 minus reciprocals of primes, roughly speaking. They have that s power. You see that. 1 minus 1 over 3 to the s. The next step would be multiplying by 1 over 5 to the s, just like we did with 1 over 2 to the s and 1 over 3 to the s, and then doing the subtraction. And on the right side, we're basically seeing the sieve of Eratosthenes, if that means anything to you. In the first step, we knocked out all of of those multiples of 2. Then we knocked out all of the remaining multiples of 3. The next step would have us knocking out all of the remaining multiples of 5. That is, multiples of 5 which are neither multiples of 2 nor 3. And if we continued this process indefinitely, since we know every positive integer greater than 1 either is prime or can be factored into primes by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we will eventually knock out all of these terms except for 1. For example, in a couple more steps, we would be dealing with 1 minus 1 over 11 to the s, at which point this term and all multiples of 11 would get cancelled out. So then, in a nutshell, what we've established is if we take the sum of the reciprocals of the s powers of the positive integers and multiply that by all of these factors, factors of the form 1 minus 1 over p to the s for all prime numbers p, we will eventually cancel out all terms of this sum except for the very first term, which is 1. That will never get cancelled out. So this product, which may have infinitely many factors or may not, we do not know, we're trying to establish the infinitude of primes, so perhaps this stops at some point, but regardless, it is equal to 
one. Then if we divide both sides of this equation by this product that's on the left side of the left side, leaving just this sum by itself on the left side of the equation, then we will have just about established the equality we sought. Doing that division would leave us with this sum on the left side. And then on the right, we would have one divided by that product, the product of all terms of the form one minus one over p to the s, where p is a prime number. Instead of taking the reciprocal of this product, which is what we see now, we could instead put the whole right side in the product by taking the reciprocal of each individual term. That would then be the product of 1 divided by 1 minus 1 over p to the s. But of course, 1 over p to the s is the same as p to the negative s. And we have thus established the desired equality for real numbers s greater than 1. Now, we have to think about what happens when we replace s with positive 1 and see how that relates at all to there being infinitely many primes. Here's the equation we get replacing s with positive 1. Now, the expression on the right is a little bit more mysterious because it's multiplication and it deals with the prime numbers. But the expression on the left, as we know, is just the sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers, which we began to write out earlier. Now, we need to consider the size of this sum. Does it approach a particular finite number, or does it get arbitrarily large? We have reason to believe that it may approach a finite value, because the numbers we're adding together are getting smaller and smaller. 1 over 4, 1 over 5, 1 over 6, and so on. The things we're adding together are approaching zero, so it's certainly possible that this is approaching some finite value. On the other hand, we are adding infinitely many positive numbers, so it's it's also possible that this sum on the left gets arbitrarily large, and we would say it diverges to infinity. In fact, the behavior of this sum on the left will answer all of our questions, because if there are finitely many primes, then certainly this product on the right has to converge, which is to say it is equal to some finite value. That's because if there are finitely many primes, then this product on the right is just like any other product you've seen in your life. You just multiply some amount of stuff together, you get a definite answer at the end. Of course, if this sum on the left converges to some finite value, well, this equal product on the right must also converge. So if this sum on the left converges, there must be finitely many primes because this product converges. So the question of if there are infinitely many primes or not comes down to showing that this sum on the left in fact diverges. A sum of infinitely many terms like we have here on the left is called a series, and this series on the left is very famous. It's called the harmonic series. And we're going to show that indeed this series does diverge to infinity. We'll walk through a proof by Nicole Oresme, who proved it in the 1300s. Interestingly, his proof was lost, and it was not reproven that this series diverges for several hundred more years. Hopefully you'll agree that if we were adding up infinitely many copies of the fraction one half, that would certainly diverge to infinity. Does this sum ever pass a million? Well, yes it does. If you go two million terms into this sum, you exceed a million. Does it ever pass a billion? Yes, just go two billion terms into the sum. Clearly, it gets arbitrarily large. To see that the harmonic series, the infinite sum of the reciprocals of the positive integers, also diverges to positive infinity, we will try to view it in a similar way, as an infinite sum of copies of one half. Here's how the argument goes. Note the first term in this sum is 1, which of course is greater than or equal to 1 half. The next term in the sum happens to be 1 half, which is also greater than or equal to 1 half. Then, note that 1 fourth is less than 1 third. So these next two terms are both at least 1 fourth. So we could say that this sum, these two terms, is at least 1 fourth plus one fourth, because again, a fourth 
is less than a third. And of course, a fourth plus a fourth is one half. So these next two terms added together is at least one half. Similarly, one eighth is less than one seventh, and it's less than one sixth, and it's less than one fifth. So all of the next four terms are indeed at least one eighth. So this sum of the next four terms is at least one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth plus one eighth. Again, that's because all of these terms, except for the last one, are strictly greater than an eighth. So if we add them all together, for sure we're going to get something that's at least as big as four copies of one eighth, which of course happens to be one half. So again, we have these four terms that add up to something that's certainly at least a half. And this pattern continues following powers of two. We could add up the next eight terms and we would get something that is at least a half. We would add up everything from one ninth through one sixteenth. Since we can view this then as an infinite sum of copies of one half, we just have to keep taking larger and larger groups of its terms, certainly this series must grow to infinity. Now it does so very, very slowly. Just to get the next one half after we add up the next eight terms, we would then have to add up 16 terms. Then we'd have to add up another 32 terms to get another copy of one half, and then 64 terms, and so on. It grows exceptionally slowly, but it does indeed diverge to infinity. And we thus have Euler's proof of the infinitude of primes. We established this equation, and we just saw that this series on the left gets arbitrarily large. It is infinite. It diverges to infinity. And certainly, this product on the right, which is taken over all prime numbers, cannot possibly equal this sum on the left, which diverges to infinity, unless this product on the right has infinitely many factors, and thus there must be infinitely many prime numbers. And we can view this interesting proof of such a basic result as the beginning of analytic number theory. We have analysis looking at the sum of an infinite series being used to prove things about the natural numbers, that there are infinitely many primes. And you may find it interesting that a very similar argument needs to be used to figure out what the likelihood is of randomly choosing two positive integers that have no factors in common. I'll leave a link in the description to my video going over that. But that's Euler's proof of the infinitude of primes. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math videos on the internet. From my fate, twisting to escape this Tithing on them up, my, my wrist if you can break it Breaking in my past, I'm making it up fast So slow down, give me the time so I can fake it Erase it to the words and just how I say shit and let me speak my poetry to your face It's not in the mid if you ain't listening Not infinite if you ain't really in the